Welcome back to History, the show where we look at famous women in history and discuss their stories. Tonight we have some very special guests on our show, the Queens of Sheba. What's that? Queens, I hear you ask. Well, for those of you that don't know, there are a number of different representations and portrayals of the Queen of Sheba that have circulated for many, many years. Luckily for us here on the Historical Podcast, we've got all the queens here to tell us their stories. The story of the Queen of Sheba comes from 1 Kings 10 in the Old Testament of the Bible and is repeated almost word for word in 2 Chronicles 9. The Queen, hearing of Solomon's wisdom, travelled from her distant kingdom to him with many followers and camels, carrying huge amounts of spices, gold and precious stones. The Queen asked Solomon a few hard questions and recognised the greatness of both Solomon and God. She then gave him the spices, gold and stones she had brought. Solomon gave her whatever she wanted and she and her followers returned home. A reminder to our listeners that this show will contain mature themes. Okay, without further ado, here are the embodied versions of the Queen of Sheba's patrols introducing themselves. Say hello for us, your majesties. Good evening, I am the powerful Queen of Sheba, a virtuous matriarch to my kingdom. <sighs> Ignore her. She's boring. I'm the demonized Sheba from the medieval age. I'm here to take your children and challenge God's authority. Hello there, everyone. You're all looking lovely, but not nearly as lovely as me. My sexualization started around the same time as demonic presentation and wasn't too positive. More recently, in the wake of feminism, I've become an empowering figure for many. In any case, if you want my number, it's... Let's move on now to the Queen associated with race and exoticism. Hello. I'm related to the Queen of Sheba's portrayal in media. The Queen of Sheba has been claimed by so many different cultures that it's a struggle to know my identity or even ethnicity. In the modern era, there has certainly been an increase in controversy about my portrayal. As the original Sheba written about in the Old Testament, I'm wondering how I am meant to feel about all this variety. My story was less than 400 words in the Bible, and it focused on diplomacy and trade. All this hullabaloo means my story was transformed a lot. Well, there is a lot to unpack there. Prior to today's podcast, we asked our listeners to send in tweets with any questions they had regarding the varying representations of the Queens. Perhaps you've always wanted to know why there was an emergence of a new depiction of a queen, or maybe you wanted to know how these queens feel about being portrayed in a certain way. Well, let's get underway and find out what our queens have to say after this short break. For those of you tweeting us asking about the song that was playing during our break, it was a short snippet of Handel's The Arrival of the Queen of Sheba. That classic piece was composed in 1749 and depicts the moment Solomon and the Queen of Sheba meet. Right, our first question which has been sent in via Twitter from Queen Lover 101 Why do you think later writers were so eager to portray you sexually when there is so little to suggest you are sexual in the Old Testament? Any thoughts, Your Highnesses? It is rather offensive, in my opinion, to be branded as a lewd individual. Who would have thought that such betrayals could be drawn off from just 400 words in the Old Testament text in which I originate? Have you seen the way that Quaker chap depicted me in his artwork? It's shocking, really, how someone could think of me in such a way. Care to expand with regards to the pointer work, ma'am? Certainly. Have you seen the way how I am dressed? In the Old Testament, I am a queen of immense wealth capable of talking to Solomon as an equal. Grand would be a fitting single word description. Well, I think I look good. Perhaps these artists and authors find something so gorgeously other about such a powerful and sexual woman. This is how they choose to portray it. In Edward Pointer's artwork, yes, I may be wearing minimal clothing, but have you seen my marvellous accessories? Look how grand and lavish they are. That element of me being amazing has remained, or at least the allure caused by the idea of my exotic nature. I believe artists and writers have taken the knowledge about my kingdom from the Old Testament, the gold, the silver, the precious stones, and have chosen to implement them into my physical appearance. I can't say I blame them. Look how glorious I look. Excuse you, but I believe this is my department? After all, I'm the one they call Lilith in works like the Book of Esther. 
I'm the sexually wanton demon. How can a demon be sexy? Look at yourself. You have webbed feet and hairy legs and some portrayals. You're lucky to get any attention at all. Now, now, your majesties. The Monic Queen, could you explain it? Sure. There's a long-standing theory known to many as the male gaze theory. It's the idea that male authors, artists, and so on, present women in a way that is sexually appealing to the audience. The male gaze fetishizes women, by usually making women passive. But me, I'm powerfully sexual. That makes me an other to them, and something that is bad to the patriarchy, as well as alluring. My sexual nature makes me a demon. I'm a powerful individual because I defy gender norms. Men are assumed to be the leaders in society. However, when you see a woman, such as myself, taking charge of a kingdom, people perceive me to be the sinister and demonic entity. Hence the depictions of me as animalistic and a ghastly creature. My physical features, such as hairy legs, show me breaching gender roles. My unfeminine ways make me sexually empowered and a threat to men. I see it. Interesting way to approach the topic. Thank you for your contribution, Demonic Queen. Moving onwards, our next question is from Lucy Loves History. What does race mean to you, and how has it affected portrayals of you as another? Which of our queens would like to initiate this discussion? If I may begin this, please. I personally believe that the idea of my race has been altered significantly throughout time. Initially, there was no specific depiction of my race. The foundation of my story suggests that I am exotic. It is well known to people that I have a kingdom full of luxurious and opulent goods. Gold, silver, precious stones and gems. All of these associated with the Far East. My race had not been explicitly made clear in the Old Testament. So would you say you were considered exotic before any discussion of your race took place? Oh, certainly. I've always been seen as exotic by people. Have you seen the countless pieces of artwork where I'm surrounded by objects and creatures of a similarly exotic nature? Take the 1923 Ivory Apes and Peacocks painting. I'm seen riding a lavish throne on the back of an African elephant surrounded by peacocks and monkeys. Whilst you are definitely exotic, are you not presented as white in this image? Yes, this is one of the pieces of art that portrays me as a Caucasian woman. There are numerous instances where I appear white, one of the key examples being within film. In 1959, my story was retold by King Vidor, the director of Solomon and Sheba. The actress who played me, Gina Lolo Bovida, was a well-known sex symbol at the time when Hollywood in general was extremely whitewashed. According to the Cabra Nagast, an Ethiopian Christian text, which tells the story of the meeting of myself and Solomon, and how our child Menelik paved the way for the Ethiopian dynasty, I am presented as a maternal, dark-skinned queen. This inspired modern films to portray me as black, like the 1990s film with Halle Berry. So are you suggesting that the Queen of Sheba is a woman of colour? Personally, I would consider myself to be a woman of colour, though the exotic queen may have a differing opinion. Considering all of the images that portray me in conflicting ways, there can be a real debate about my identity. I'm quite racially ambiguous. In 2010, Laura James depicted my true self, surrounded by other women in the painting Queen Omega, where my roots are in Ethiopia and therefore am not white. Other depictions contrast this. Such a multitude of peoples have reimagined me as their own, and that became complex. The Old Testament never says where Sheba is, but historians think it might be the ancient Sabaean kingdom in modern-day Yemen. Though I'm portrayed as white and black in Hollywood, I consider myself Arabic. My kingdom may have stretched across the Red Sea into Ethiopia, though. So different places and times have portrayed you as different races? Yes! Definitely a complex idea there. On to our final question of the evening. From historian Saba83, why do you think your portrayals have been so frequently reinterpreted over the millennia? I should begin this, being the queen of the Old Testament. I think the themes at the core of my story are attractive to people. Exoticism, power and wealth have all been embodied in one mysterious woman. Me! I'm like Cleopatra, another powerful queen who has been sexualized and demonized for thousands of years. There are so many reinterpretations of us from such little source material, but I suppose that makes it easier to be creative with my story, which explains why I'm reinterpreted so much as a figure after the Old Testament. With all of this sexualization and demonization, I really stand out as a contrast to the other queens, thus inspiring debate about our true nature. My virtuous portrayal in the Cabernet Gas turns events on its head and makes me the main protagonist as opposed to Solomon. Here I am, devout and chaste, which totally contrasts the demonic portrayals of me, like the ones we see in the Targum Shanai. I know for myself that I am shown as virtuous so that the Ethiopian nation could legitimise their links to Solomon and the line of David. By changing my story so that Solomon seduces me, 
resulting in our son Menelik, the Ethiopian monarchy could say that their royal line came from the Davinic dynasty. It seems that over time, the popularity of the Queen of Sheba story can significantly differ in Royce, sometimes completely changing in terms of your traits. I'd say... Whatever you say... The sexualization and demonization does make us so much more interesting, doesn't it? Maybe people are bored with queens being so motherly and pious. A demon queen is far more dangerous and entertaining. I've been a sexualized object for men for a long time. Look at the advert for the 1959 Sheba and Solomon film. I'm lounging about in a bar with my leg out. Isn't that great? But lately, I've become a sexually empowering figure because women's sexuality is seen more positively in today's society. The evolution occurring between medieval and modern representations of my sexualization seen here demonstrates how much the themes associated with Sheba have changed. I'm amazed I'm finding myself agreeing with the sexual queen on something, but I agree. These reinterpretations can be extremely different and added a lot of complexity. The examples discussed within this podcast alone have demonstrated that there are a multitude of paintings and film that have shown me in varying lights, all of which take root from my small beginnings as the Queen of the Old Testament. Brilliant to end on a positive note, because that's all we've got time for tonight. Could our Queens please summarise themselves in a sentence? I am the Queen of the Old Testament. I'm short and sweet. Sometimes the original is the best. I have become a majestic and maternal monarch. A symbol for women of colour. I used to be mocked for my sexuality, but now I'm proud. If any of you are ever in Sheba, hit me up. Different cultures have taken my image and portrayed me differently. Sometimes white, sometimes Arabian, sometimes Ethiopian, but really, no one knows. Not even me. Amazing stuff. But we'll see you next week with more history. Good night.